All right, so I wanted to do a video on how to use Inkscape to create a vector-based set of blueprints from an existing architectural set. Uh, so in this demo, we're going to use the existing uh, set of blueprints that you see in front of you on the screen. Uh, this is something that I scanned and brought in. Uh, I had to do I had to do a good bit of manipulation in GIMP uh, to prepare it and make it ready for use in here. Uh, and there's actually a lot of work that goes into getting an image ready and making sure that it will work. Uh, because what we're doing here is we're trying to create not a perfectly accurate copy of you know a paper set of plans, but one that's reasonably accurate, accurate enough that you can use it for you know laying out new rooms or changing partitions or you know maybe locating plumbing and electrical utilities or you know fire escape routes and stuff like that. Uh, so we want it to be as accurate as possible, but in the end, you know, it'll never be something that you'd want to use for you know actual engineering or, or actually constructing something like that. Certainly wouldn't recommend that. There's four key tools that I like to use. The first here at the top is the object picker. Uh, the second is the node editor and that comes in very very handy in manipulating vectors, changing them, adding, deleting stuff, things like that. Uh, down here is the measurement tool. Uh, now Inkscape doesn't give you measurements in, in feet uh, its largest measurements, in, at least in the English system, or the imperial system, is, is inches. And then, of course, in metric, the best you can get is centimeters. So, kind of a limitation there. You know, it would be nice if I could see feet, but whatever. So, the measurement tool comes in handy every now and then. And then, finally, down here where is the tool that I use to draw all of the walls. The Bezier curve and straight line tool. Now, the next thing to point out I should point out is that this toolbar here across the top is dependent upon the tool that's selected. So it's, uh, you know, it, it has a context. Uh, so, and the context, of course, is the selected tool. So the tool, so for example, these uh, these tools here, these buttons here, are, uh, are relevant to the object picker tool. So if I pick the node editor tool, you see that there's a whole different set of, of, of buttons that shows up. Um, then on the right hand side you have this panel right here and this panel is for uh, inspecting a selected object so the dialogues that show up here or the uh, the views that show up here in this panel on the right uh, are used then to manipulate a drawn vector for example so the first in fact what you see here right now is the object viewer now I'm going to close that just to show you how to open it the object viewer is new and if you go to the object menu and select objects that brings the viewer up in the panel at the right. And the object viewer, like I say, it's it's new with the current version of Inkscape, which I believe is, yes, 0 0.92. Uh, so if you have Inkscape 0 0.91, the object the object viewer doesn't exist, which is really, which is really amazing to me, uh, because this sort of view, this sort of uh, thing, is so so valuable when you're dealing with complex graphics, you know, where you're creating a lot of objects. Because within the object viewer, all of the objects that I create in this document are listed quite nicely for me. Uh, and they're sorted by the layer on which they exist. Um, I realize I haven't spoken about layers yet, so we'll, we'll hit that real quick here. Down here at the bottom, on, this, on the bar across the bottom, you see there's the layer drop down. And right now, main floor is the layer I currently have selected. Now there's actually two layers, one called background and, and, the, and then the other called main floor. If I select background, now that you can see is the active layer in the object picker. Now you can see there is one object in my background layer, which is main floor blueprint, that is this image. Now when I start this, the first thing I do is I put the background uh, image on its own separate layer and then I lock it. Because the last thing I want to do, once I get it sized and, and fit the way I want it, the last thing I, I want to do is mess with it. I don't want to touch it at all. So I lock it. Um, and then next to that you see this eye button. If you click that, that turn makes the layer visible or invisible. Okay. So the other layer that I have in this document already is my main floor layer. So if we go back to the object view, you see with my main floor layer expanded, you can see all of the objects that exist in that layer. Now you can't see any because I have that layer turned off. So we'll turn it on and now you can see the blueprint that I've drawn so far. Okay. Now with the with this view selected, I can go through and I can pick each of these objects. 
I can right click um, and I can do I can perform a variety of op operations I can rename it for example I can duplicate it create a new object so on uh, so the object picker is really really handy for managing all of the objects that are in your in your document now in terms of this video what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a separate layer to show what we're doing so we'll turn that layer off we'll go to the layer menu and pick add layer and now for the name I'm going to give it video demo and when you when you create a new layer it asks for a position above current is the default and for the most part you're not going to ever really want to change that unless you kind of get into the details and, and have you know complex issues going on for the most part you're not going to have to worry too much about where your how your layers are sorted or organized so I'm just going to accept above current for the default and click add now I have a new layer you see that it appears above main floor which was previously my my current layer and down here in the drop down you see video demo is now selected now everything that I draw is going to be drawn on the video demo layer. Incidentally, if I make a mistake and I realize, oh, I meant for that to go on the main floor layer instead, I can easily go up to layer. I, I pick the object that I, I drew, I go to layer, and then I choose um, move selection to layer. Uh, so you can very easily move objects between layers and, and make sure everything is where it needs to be. Uh, the other, the only other things I want to point out about the interface are the two toolbars to the right of this uh, of this panel here. And you see, this first toolbar has a lot of basic file management functions like new and save and print, undo, redo, cut, copy, paste. Uh, and then down below that are these magnifying glasses. Now these glasses allow you to fit the view to whatever object you have selected. So, for example, if I'm working on my main floor layer, which I'll turn on again, and I pick stairs front entry center you see that the the center set of stairs in the entryway are selected with this dashed line bounding box now once I've chosen them I can go over to this magnifying glass click it and my zoom fills to fit to that um, it's kind of a basic function uh, but I gotta admit I use it quite a bit more than I thought I would so it's a handy little tool uh, then on the right of that are the tools that are making scape really really cool it really helps at least for for this so without these tools you really couldn't get this done and they are the snaps now at the very top is the button that allows you to enable snapping so if it's not selected all of your other snapping options are disabled below that are three different snapping uh, groups there's snap to bounding boxes which is that dashed line uh, there's snap to uh, nodes paths and handles which is what I like to use and then below that is snap to other points which I haven't ever used and we'll disable that. Now in the center section snap to nodes pads and handles it allows you to choose different things you know snap to an intersection snap to a corner point uh, snap to a path and you can have one or any or all of them selected at once and they'll all take precedence as the context dictates. I like to have them all enabled it seems to work pretty well that way normally that's the sort of thing like you'd probably want to choose one at a time but but it really, at least as far as Inkscape goes, it seems to work pretty well. So, uh, so with all that said, we'll move on and I'll show you how to start actually drawing these blueprints. So we're going to shut off the main floor layer. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in on my plan set here. And I'm going to pick this angled corner here. Then I'm going to go to my Bezier tool. And you see my icon changes to a, a pen with a plus, a fountain pen with a plus and I'm going to pick what looks like about the middle of the wall on the line between the two corners corner points which kinda looks like right there now once I click hmm, something's happened oh there you go I'm currently drawing on the main floor layers we're gonna hit escape and since the main floor layer is hidden you can't see what you're drawing so I'm switching to the video demo layer like I should have done before and I'm going to try again so I'm going to pick this midpoint click and there you can see I'm starting and it creates this red rubber band line now I'm going to zoom over to the end of the outer wall and what I could do is simply visually pick what looks like the middle to me 
But I know for a fact that this wall here is straight, is horizontal. So there kind of comes a point where, yes, you want to follow the set of plans, but at the same time, you want to overcome, you know, limitations like, you know, distortions in the scan or things like that. And you don't want to just follow them blindly. So here, because I know my wall is supposed to be horizontal, I want to make a perfectly horizontal line. And I can do that very easily in Inkscape by holding on, holding down the control button. And when I do that, the line automatically locks to horizontal. Now what it's actually doing is it's allowing me to lock the line to a specific uh, angle. So for example, if I hold down control and I'm close to horizontal, it hot locks to horizontal. If I move my cursor down, you see that the line jumps 15, 30, 45, 60, 75, and then if we scroll over here, there's 90. Perfect vertical. So it's, it's a really, really handy feature. When you're drawing a Bezier curve, you hold down control and it locks it locks the line to one of 15, uh, one of several 15 degree increments. So I've locked my line to a perfect horizontal, and now I'm going to just visually choose what looks like the middle of the wall. I'm going to click that, and I'm still rubber banding, so I'm just going to move up here and just find a point to dead end this. So I'll pick this point right here. Now, like I say, it's interesting to note that while I was at the middle of the wall at the bottom here, I've actually kind of moved to the outside of it, or the inside of it, rather, uh, this far up. And again, that's distortion in the image, and you can eliminate most of it, but you'll never get rid of all of it. So. I'm going to just kind of pick that point there, right click to end the object and call it good. Now when I'm done, what I've done is I've actually I've created the object and it's and and it's selected by default and you can tell because of the dash bounding box which traces the limits of the object. Now the actual object are just two vectors which follow the uh, the right side and the bottom of that bounding box. You can't really see it because the default styles for these vectors in Inkscape, at least at this scale, are really kind of useless. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make that just a little bit more visible. Now to do that, we'll go to the layer, excuse me, object, and uh, I always got to look to find it here. Here we go. It's fill and stroke. We go to we pick fill and stroke, and we see that the dialog shows up here in our panel to the right. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to choose the stroke style tab, highlight the width and change it to 0.67. It's just the number I use. It doesn't mean much, it's just a number. Uh, but I change it to 0.67 and now our line shows up a little bit more clearly. Even when I zoom all the way out you can still see it pretty well. Um, now before I, I get too much into that, the one thing I want to point out is that when you're using the object picker and you select an object, the object picker allows you to manipulate it in one of two ways. Uh, first, you can uh, change the overall size of the object. You get these arrows, these double-headed arrows, on the sides and at the corners of the object. So for example, I got this angled double-headed arrow, I highlight it, I pick it, and it allows me to expand or shrink the size of my object. And that is not locked to an aspect ratio. It moves in two dimensions independent of each other. The other double-headed arrows are horizontal and vertical only which allows me to change it specifically in just one dimension. Now if I go back and I click on my selected object again, those arrows change and they allow me to go from simple scaling to rotation. At least the corner arrows do. If I pick the, vert if I pick the uh, arrows along the sides, I can shear my object vertically and horizontally. Now, I'm also going to draw one other line here, specifically this one. Maybe I'll draw two. And when I draw this line in rubber band mode, I can zoom in. And if I get close, you see that this green X shows up on the vector. If I float my the end of my line on the vector, this green X shows up, and I see this note, Handle to Path. Here before it. What's happening is my snap, snap to paths, is currently taking effect and it's snapping the end of my line to the midpoint of this vector. If I take it out here to the end, handle to cusp node. Okay, so there it's picking the very end, a specific node. Um, not sure exactly which one, but it's specific, but it's picking a specific node. That's not it. 
uh, so that it makes sure that the two ends of our vectors will meet. So what I'm going to do here, so what I can do is I can just click on it like that and then right click and undone. Now you see that my line still looks as bad as, it, as the previous line did. And the reason for that is that Inkscape really doesn't provide a way for you to uh, create a default style, at least not very easily that I'm aware of. Uh, so if you want to, if, if you want to reproduce a style, for example, I want to make sure that all of my lines look like this, you can either pick on it, you can either choose it and change it here in stroke style, or you can pick a line that has the style that you want, type control C, and then pick the line that you want to apply the style to and hit control shift V. Now I copied the original line, but when I use control shift V, rather than control V, which is just straight paste. I don't actually create a new copy of the line that I picked. I simply copy the style of the line that I picked onto the line that I've chosen. So you can see now that the line that I've chosen looks the same as the other line. Now here's, here's, the, here's the issue though with, these, uh, with the snaps. You note that I, I took the end of this line and I snapped it to the end of that line. Fine and dandy. But in the end, I have two separate vectors, and the ends, they, they don't look great. So if I want to fix that, what I can do is I can choose both vectors, and I can join them together and make a single vector out of that. And to do that, I type Control-K. Now both vectors exist as the same object. Now when I choose that object, if I go to my Edit Node tool, I can zoom in and you see that I have a node right here and I can pick it and drag it and that moves the end of one of the vectors okay unfortunately it's not what I want uh, what I want to do is I want to is what I what I want to do is I want to make is I want to join these two nodes together and I want them to be just one node to create a complete corner so in order to do that I pick my two nodes and then I go up here and what I can do is in the node editor there's a variety of different node editing functions available you can just hover over them and see the tooltip for example I can add a new node to a line I can delete an existing uh, I can join two nodes into one which is what I want to do here so if I pick these two nodes like I did and I click that tool it joins them into one and it creates that corner the problem is and I'm sure you noticed is that it makes the ends of each line move uh, and you see basically what it happened what happens is it does is what happens is excuse me it finds the midpoint of the two selected nodes and it creates the new node at that midpoint I don't want that to happen so I'm gonna undo that and before I join them I'm going to pick both and I am going to go to um, I believe it's object and choose a line and distribute now at the right hand side you see uh, the align and distribute it allows me to line up uh, objects horizontally vertically in a variety of different ways what I want to do here is I want to align these two nodes so if I go down here to the nodes section I want my alignment relative to which node the first or the second I think I picked this node first I'm gonna I'm gonna pick them again to make sure I do that so I'm gonna pick this node first and this node second now I want to align relative to the first node that I selected and the reason for that is because I moved the second node away just to demonstrate so this first node is is where it needs to be so I want to align relative to the first node that I've selected and down here I've got my alignment options and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick this horizontal uh, tool and you see that it now aligns both nodes horizontally and the only node that moved was the last picked node because I'm aligning relative to the first pick node. Then I pick the vertical alignment and you see that the two points once again lie on top of each other. Now both points are still selected so while I've got that going on I go up here and I choose join selected nodes and now I have my perfect corner right where it needs to be. while I'm at it I'm going to create one more vector here I'm going to create 
one like that. Uh, oops. Try that again. There. And then we'll go back to our node editor. And I didn't actually make that horizontal, but I'm not going to worry about it here. But I'll go back to, oops, no object in there. Pick my two objects, type control K. If I pick this object first and this one last, nope, it doesn't preserve the style. So now I have to go back and change my style. There we go. Now I go to my editor and I pick this first and then this one second. And I go to alignments. I have a second one here. So I'll do that one. And I'm going to choose first selected, horizontal, vertical. Oops, something didn't happen. Oh, whoops. Got to be careful. I had I had uh, both nodes in that line selected, so we'll unselect and we'll just pick our two nodes. Pick this one first and that one second. Align horizontally and align vertically and then join them. If we zoom in, we see we've got our corner. All right. So once I've created these uh, walls and I go on in like fashion and I build out all of my walls. Now, when I'm doing this, one of the things that I do is I ignore irregularities in the wall. For example, you know, if I know, um, I don't worry about I don't worry about windows and doors. Uh, really, what I want to do is I want to is I want to lay out my building and make sure that all of the walls that I'm drawing line up the way they're supposed to line up. So, for example, you know, if I had if I had this wall and I had a hallway running down the middle and then another wall on the other side that you know that continued on. I might just draw my line all the way across the hallway and say to heck with it. And the reason for that is after I've drawn my vectors, I can go back and I can edit those vectors to create separate ones. So for example, if I want to go back and I want to add windows, I just zoom in here to my vector and I double click at the edge of one of my windows and that creates a new point. Then I go over here to this middle uh, lockout and I create two nodes there and then I can go over here and it looks like this. All right. So now I've created four points at the edges of my windows. Now I can pick all four of those points. And in my node editor, I go up and I choose this tool, the break path at selected nodes. Once I do that, what it does is it takes each of these single nodes and splits them into two and creates, in this case, one, two, three, four, five separate vectors. And I'll show you what I mean. If I take one of these nodes and I move it, you see that I actually have a separate vector there. Now, they may be separate vectors, but they all exist in the same object. And I actually want them to be separate objects as well. So we'll pick our object, edit, our object picker, and we'll go to object mode, and we'll choose, excuse me, path. We'll go to our path menu, and we'll choose break apart. And when I choose break apart, now, with my object picker selected, you see that I actually have several separate vectors. Okay. Now these two vectors here on either side are the window. So I might pick those two and press Control K to join them together so that they both exist as a single window object. Um, and then I would go back and I would choose my walls that I split up and press control K to join them back together as well. Okay. Now, let's see. Then I can come up here and I can do the same thing with my door. So if I pick, switch to my node editing tool, double click, double click, and then pick my two nodes and pick break them apart. Then we'll pick our object picker, path, and break apart. Okay. Then if I go back, there we go, come on. There we go. If I go back and I choose and I choose this door vector that I've created, I can then edit it. 
hole that I want to do. I can go to my node editor and I can pick the end of the node and I can literally swing it out to create my door. Um, obviously a little bit of aligning needs to happen with that, but you see the point. Now the other thing that you want to do uh, when you're done creating all of your walls is you want to edit the styles of the walls so that they look like that they look like they would for an architectural set of plans. So for example, I want all of my walls to be you know thick, like six inches thick, you know is kind of your typical wall dimension wall thickness. So I pick my walls, which hmm, thought I had them joined, but apparently I don't. Uh, I pick my walls and I can go to my uh, path. So I hit fill and stroke. I can pick fill and stroke, which I have minimized over here at right. And I can change this from 0.67 to 6. Now understand my dimensions here at right are measured in inches. So now I'm saying make the thickness of my line 6 actual inches. Note that this isn't exactly how you would go about doing it in a set of plans. Note what the original draftsman did in this set of plans. They created two lines spaced at six inches, demonstrating that the wall itself is actually six inches thick. If I make my line six inches wide, that doesn't really mean that the wall is six inches thick. It just means I drew a thick line. <laughs> um, but in this case, I'm just doing it just, just for the visual consistency. So I'll accept six inches, hit tab, and that you, you can now see then that my walls now have substantial thickness to them. And I missed that one, but whatever. Now I can go back and I can also do the same thing with my windows and my door. And instead of six inches, we'll make them three. Oops, I see these left over here. We'll make that three over here. And now you see you start to have a, a set of blueprints that actually looks the way uh, blueprints actually look on an architectural set of plans where your windows are a little bit thinner than your walls and so on. And so if you want to create, you know, all the symbology, you know, like the door with maybe the uh, the arc that demonstrates the swinging track, you can do that in Inkscape um, and then copy paste it and use it all over the place. So that covers the basics of how to build a vector based set of blueprints from an architectural set of plans uh, using Inkscape. So if there's anything more you'd like to see, uh, if you any topics you'd like me to expand on, let me know in the comments. Uh, and thanks for watching.